Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Paul Morris. I'm clinical lecturer here in Sheffield in cardiology. And anyone who's been to showcases before knows that I talk about fractional flows uh, quite a lot. So uh, this year we're going to go beyond FFR and look uh, and see what Intilico Medicine can do to advance this field of research. We've only got 10 minutes, so I'm just going to talk about three things. First of all, coronary artery disease and why it's so important. Second, how we assess patients with coronary artery disease and where fractional flow reserve, FFR, fits in. And then look um, how in silico medicine can help us improve how we assess and make decisions for our patients right now with traditional techniques. Coronary artery disease is the leading cause of death in the world, so arguably it's very common and it's very serious. And it occurs when you get a, a buildup of atherosclerosis, fatty plaque inside the coronary arteries, which are the fuel pipes to the heart, which restrict blood flow and cause um, diseases like angina, heart attacks, heart failure, and of course can cause death as well. When we treat patients with coronary artery disease, we can focus on uh, changing their lifestyles, uh, modify their risk factors and behaviours. We can give them tablets or we can intervene, and it's the intervention I want to focus on today. Intervention can take the form of less invasive techniques. So what you can see on the screen is an angiogram. There's a catheter in the top left, and I'm sure you can just make out some narrowings. Uh, in, does it stop playing? And where there's a narrowing, we can deploy a wire, a balloon, and a stent, and then uh, take everything out. And that's the same artery without the narrowings. Uh, and we've got a patent uh, artery there with, uh, with good blood flow restored. This is um, less invasive. The patients are wide awake. They come and go in at the hospital in a day. Alternatively, we can do bypass surgery where we open up the patient's chest on a general anaesthetic. It's much more invasive and we quite literally plumb some conduits to bypass the blockages to restore blood flow to the heart. And for every one bypass operation, we do 10 of the stenting procedures, which is in the top row, the PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention. But how do we know when we should do a stenting procedure? How do we know when to do an operation? They're quite big decisions. Well, we do tests. And there's a whole host of tests we can do for coronary disease. Uh, and they focus on making diagnosis, assessing severity, distribution, and the prognosis of the disease. But there is one test which is arguably more important than all the others, and that's the invasive angiogram. Because anybody who gets a stent into their heart or has an operation has to have an invasive angiogram. So it's a final common test. Here's the angiogram again. Now, whilst this is a very important test, uh, and one that we make lots of decisions on, it actually um, has some problems and is slightly flawed. It only really yields anatomical information and doesn't provide any physiological information. And it's the physiology which really matters because we know that physiological assessment trumps the, um, the anatomical assessment. And the solution is fractional flow reserve, the focus of our work. To measure fractional flow reserve, we put a wire inside the coronary artery and we measure the pressure down the, down the artery, upstream and downstream of the disease, a narrowed segment, and we assess the pressure gradient, the pressure changes. We divide the distal pressure by the proximal pressure, it gives us a very um, simple ratio, which is always between zero and one, and the lower the number, the more significant and severe the disease is. The 0.8 mark is particularly important because if your FFR is less than 0.8, then we know that intervention is worth doing. If it's above, then we don't. Now this is great because it's, it's quite simple to measure in the cath lab. You just need to buy a wire and put it down the artery. It's quite simple to interpret. It just gives you a number, so the doctors are happy. If you use FFR to guide treatment, clinical outcomes improve, so the patients are happy. And if you do it on enough patients, then you save money in the long run because you reduce um, adverse, adverse uh, complications. Uh, so the accountants are happy as well. And consequently, the FFR has become the gold standard assessment for coronary artery disease. This doctor, patient, and accountant, all from the Northern General, we're all happy there at the Northern General. Okay, so that's where we're up to now. That's using traditional standard techniques. And I'm just going to pick four areas where the traditional te techniques fall short and how in silico medicine can help out providing a solution. There's plenty of areas we're working on uh, around FFR, but I've just picked four for this talk. So the first problem is that FFR is underused, even though it 
reduces, uh, improves outcomes, it reduces costs. You'd think it'd be used all the time, but it's used on less than 10% of patients. So more than 90% of patients don't actually gain any benefit from FFR. And the solution is, well, we can compute the FFR rather than measuring it directly. So you don't have to pay for a wire, don't have to put the wire down. You can just compute the FFR and it's quicker and simpler. And this is an example of a computed FFR from one of our patients in our study. We're not the only group doing this. There's HeartFlow in the States who compute FFR from CT scanning. And there's Medis um, in Europe who are doing the same thing like us from invasive angiography in their commercial enterprises. But there remains a challenge in this area, which is the models are quite difficult to tune. And it all comes down to boundary conditions, as always, in, in modeling in the human body. And accuracy on a case-specific basis is still rather limited, I would say. So there's room for improvement. Second problem is when we stand in the cath lab and we make decisions about how to treat patients, often there's multiple narrowings and multiple arteries and we really have to sort of use experience only to decide where to deploy the stents and that's very, very subjective. And once you put a stent in, you can't take it out if it doesn't have the desired effect. So we can actually simulate the physiological results of stenting before we deliver treatment to a patient to optimise our approach. And this is some work recently published in Jack Imaging uh, by Rebecca Gosling, our BHF PhD fellow, uh, proving that our model of virtual stenting appears accurate. So this has got great uh, potential, uh, helping clinicians to plan their, plan their stenting uh, uh, procedures, especially useful in multivessel uh, disease and serial stenosis, which may, many patients have. Problem three. Fractional flow reserve as it is, is very impersonal. We apply the same 0.8 threshold to all of our patients in all circumstances. And I can't really think of any area elsewhere in medicine where we do this. We don't say to patients, if your haemoglobin is less than eight, then we'll transfuse. If it's above, then we don't. Um, we just don't do that. The human body and the clinical context is always more complex than that. There's always more factors to consider. The other thing we know is FFRs uh, a ratio, it's the flow limitation compared to a hypothetical normal artery. And again, I've never seen a hypothetical normal artery in a, in a, in a human. So what we're doing is we're using silico medicine to personalize the FFR. And rather than compare uh, the FFR to a hypothetical norm, we're actually computing the patient's own maximal achievable FFR and using that as our denominator to um, derive a, a score called personalized FFR. And again, this is some data that's just been submitted, not published yet, but I think this is probably the first major um, and serious attempt to personalize FFR assessment. Number four, I'd stop calling them problems by now and call them opportunities instead. So there's many more examples, but I'll finish with this one. We all know that atherosclerosis doesn't just affect coronary arteries, it affects every organ system one outside the heart, especially in the carotid arteries, the limb and the renal arteries. And we did some work uh, last year. We took the same modeling techniques we've been using in the coronary arteries and we applied them to the renal arteries. And this is uh, a figure from a, a paper we've put together. And thank you to uh, Alberto for sharing this with me. These are renal arteries, exactly the same te CFD techniques, uh, only computing renal FFR, which is you know, perhaps something I think we're the, probably the first to First to, first to do in Sheffield. Um, we're hoping that these techniques will be, the benefits will be extended outside of the heart to other arteries like renal arteries to help select patients who may benefit from revascularization. So to summarize, coronary physiology is very important when making decisions about how to treat patients with coronary artery disease. And we're using in silico models here in Sheffield to extend the, um, the benefits of using physiology uh, with reduced hardware, quicker assessment methods, Helping, to, uh, helping clinicians to uh, plan their treatments and also to personalise patient assessments. And hopefully we can help you take these techniques well beyond the heart as well. Thank you very much. How widely available is this technology? Is it just available in Sheffield or is, is it across the NHS in England? Well, I hope it will be soon. Soon, right? Yeah, yeah. coming to, come to a cath lab near you soon, hopefully. Uh, the next step for us is really um, the translational step. So taking it to companies, trying to commercialise. There's a whole there's a whole other challenges to overcome, like regulation, uh, validation. Thank you.
that sort of stuff. We validated our models to an extent, but for regulatory approval, we'll need a different level. 